Welcome to Mavericks. I'm Joey Garcia. In this episode, we'll be speaking to one of the masters in the trade markets. He spearheaded the acquisition and sale of over 100 companies and is the CEO of Oasis Pro Markets. He's widely respected and is a true maverick. It's Pat Levecchia. This is Mavericks, brought to you by Zappa Bank. Morning, Pat. It's uh, it's awesome to have you here with us today and one of the first Zappa Mavericks that we've got. Um, I think it would be useful for, for people to hear just you, from you generally, like in terms of your background, how do you get to the position that you've got to today with Oasis Pro Markets? Just really general sort of picture. Sure. Um, and it's a pleasure being here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, <clears throat> so I'm an investment banker by background, 25 plus years on Wall Street. Um, I was with Credit Suisse and Bear Stearns, which is now J.P. Morgan. And uh, I also ran capital markets for a group uh, called First Horizon. Um, I had the opportunity to uh, go off on my own in the late 2000s and uh, explore many different industries. And uh, about four, four and a half years ago, I was approached about crypto. And crypto uh, to me, crypto and blockchain. And uh, it didn't make any sense to me. I thought it was tulip mania all over again in regards to um, specifically uh, this currency made up and, and people were, were trading it. And it took me about six months to a year to figure out that blockchain and crypto were two different things. And that in regards to Bitcoin and ETH especially, and, and potentially some other altcoins, that there was demand for it and there was from an asset standpoint, diversity diversification opportunity. But blockchain specifically is very exciting. It's an evolution of technology. A lot of, a, a lot of um, people are talking about it as a revolution, but I, I see it as an evolution um, because it's very transparent. The costs are very low and um, it's been resilient. You hear about hacks in the blockchain, yeah. but it's not really the base blockchain, which is Ethereum. Yeah. It's the apps built on top of it that have gotten hacked. So, um, and let, let me, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but let me ask you one question around that because you talked about some of the bank, your banking background, those are large institutions. This is an emerging, like developing industry. I think you also did a, an MBA around strategic planning, et cetera. So how, how, how relevant has your, that history been in, let's call it the startup universe and a new developing ecosystem? What, 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 what lessons did you bring from that old world to the new world? Yeah, uh, fantastic question. I basically all the skills I develop being part of large institutions and what we call TradFi are very applicable to the prof bringing professionalism to this blockchain and crypto world. So um, there, there are many aspects um, from a startup standpoint. I, I also have done other startups um, as a merchant banker in the past. So I've gone through that process before. But here um, with Oasis Pro, I'm, I'm utilizing all the skills that we had at um, those firms in the past. And what's really exciting is a year ago, um, the large players on Wall Street uh, and, and globally um, would uh, have calls with us. And then they would say, come back to us in six months or three months, or this isn't on our roadmap right now. Yeah. In the last six months or so, it has, it has moved at rapid speed where when we have a conversation, we'll have another one in two weeks or three weeks. And this isn't necessarily coming from us, but this is the large institutions. So you've seen Bank of New York Mellon, one of the largest custodians now moving into Bitcoin and ETH for their institutional clients. You've seen Fidelity do the same. So the demand is coming from the institutions and, and the large players are starting to move in this area. So my background in terms of working at large banks has been very helpful in those discussions with these large infrastructure players and Wall Street firms. And what do you think, Pat, what do you think like the industry or this emerging industry still needs to learn? I mean, you've talked, I, I think you used the term once in one of the articles you wrote around this being a Ferrari on training wheels. That was your, yeah. your term. What, what are the key missing lessons do you think in, in in the industry that exists today? Regulation is first and foremost and, and compliance on everyone's mind. In regards to our focus, which is digital asset securities, <clears throat> there's, there's also an issue of 
at, at least in the US, but this is um, really uh, uh, from a global perspective, they're taking 70-year-old um, laws, 80-year-old yeah. laws, and applying it to the blockchain, which frankly makes it very clunky and doesn't, uh, doesn't take on the benefits of blockchain, such as transparency, uh, no counterparty risk. Really, there's no need for clearing and settlement firms with the blockchain. Um, but, but the regulators aren't comfortable with coming out with a whole new um, uh, uh, swath of, of rules and regulations. They're moving very slowly. Yeah. Um, you know, as we were going through the approval process that we did in the US, um, the question that came up three different times over about a six to seven month period with the regulators was, how do miners impact the blockchain? Which is a very basic question. But their concern was that um, Bitcoin miners and, 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 um, and, and other miners would have the impact of stopping transactions. Now we know it was, it's peer to peer and that can happen, but that's the concern. And that's a basic concern to regulators. So we're inching forward and what we need is rules and regulations. We need to understand that blockchain brings a lot of benefits. The blockchain in the, in the US, um, the blockchain's not considered a good control location. So what does that mean? That means that um, even though everything is on the blockchain, all transaction hashes are, that uh, the regulators don't view that as a definitive record. So you need transfer agents, clearing yeah. firms, settlement firms to provide that. Um, very clunky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me let me let me ask you one. Let me ask you two difficult questions. Um, the first one is like you, and I was interested before you said that you know the distinction between crypto and blockchain. What would you say to the argument that um, I don't know a unit of BTC is a unit of account on the Bitcoin protocol, and a unit on any other related sort of protocol or any security that is, is effectively a unit of account on that on that protocol. So is there really any difference between a crypto ecosystem and a blockchain ecosystem or are they more aligned than people appreciate? I, I think that's a great observation. I, I, I would agree with you completely. I yeah. think they're completely aligned. And, and, and let, let me ask you one other one, which is because you use the word transparency and you mentioned FTX. So that, that's a public you know, conversation point, right? How in these transparent, open, immutable networks have we seen a recreation of, and you use the Madoff example, some people use the Lehman example, are we like replicating the issues that have existed in the financial services problem areas on the blockchain world or how, how, how yeah. So, so, um, so that's very, I don't see it as a Lehman moment because Lehman was a liquidity crisis and uh, fraud wasn't involved in that. Uh, Madoff was fraud, uh, Enron was fraud. You know, there are a lot of rules and regulations globally in all different markets, here in the UK, in the US, in emerging markets. Um, there's always fraud. Yeah. You, you know, regarding, um, you know, fraudsters, they'll always figure out a way to get around the regulations until they're caught. And that's just typical. There's insider trading, et cetera. So it, there's no perfect system. The same thing will occur with the blockchain, but with transparency, it'll be easier to track transactions. Now what FTX did was, um, uh, you know, working with Alameda, they were uh, commingling customer funds. So the transaction hashes didn't really cover that. Uh, but going forward, it, it would be easier. We've, we've provided that argument. I know you have and others have to the regulators regarding the transparency and the benefit of blockchain. Um, eventually they will get there. I think in five to 10 years, this will be ubiquitous yeah. in regards to the capital markets. Eventually they will get there and they're getting more comfortable with it. But again, you're dealing with regulators and the, the purpose of regulators is not to put the markets at risk. So they move quite slowly. And do you think that in terms of, you know, the adoption of this technology and the crypto industry in all of the emerging markets and things that are developing around the world, do you think that the barriers to that happening quicker are regulation or, or what are the other barriers? Is it, or is it education and understanding or is it just general sort of 
What, what do you think that the, the restrictors are of this technology going from 5% of the world to 50% of the world? I, I, personally, I, I, the technology is there. And um, um, the, uh, to, for us, it's regulation. That's, that's the main issue. There are also issues regarding there is no global um, listing. Um, and that may take, uh, you know, some time because you need all the regulators, in, uh, well, in, in the major countries to agree to it. Um, if it, the blockchain would allow for global listings, which would be tremendous in regards to especially emerging markets yep. and access to emerging markets. Um, but yeah, we're, we're not there yet. To, from my perspective, it's all regulatory based. And our approach is that we're very strong in the U.S. and we, we want to partner in, in other jurisdictions. Rather than, rather than put our own feet on the ground, we wanna have strong partners uh, that are like-minded, um, you know, focused on, on building this ecosystem. Yeah, and, and tell me something, so in terms of, we haven't really talked specifically around digital securities, um, but I mean, I, I, I think I'd say, if you have classic exchanges or the crypto exchanges in the world, then you have the, the regulated securities platforms, the ATS platforms, the MTF platforms, et cetera. What, what, do you think, um, what do you think exists in the ATS world or the MTF world, the regulated world, that doesn't yet exist in the, in the crypto world? Well, uh, we've been talking about regulation. Obviously, you know, regulation exists, um, professional players, you know, I'd like to think that, you know, our team is probably 75% TradFi, uh, 25% uh, tech and DeFi. <clears throat> um, you have a credibility uh, issue in, in, in uh, what I call the crypto space yeah. uh, versus the um, regulated um, asset space. Um, so credibility is very important. Like I said, we're speaking to a, large, a lot of the major banks in the world, custodians, a whole host of different players. And that credibility, the fact that you're regulated um, allows you to um, you know, have a seat at the table to start those discussions, the education process, working with them from an infrastructure standpoint. Do you think, do you think this as it develops, will there be more and more crypto platforms adopting the licensing or regulation to bring digital securities on board? Or will it be the incumbent sort of large global exchanges starting to gain access to virtual assets? Which, which one, which, who's gonna win that race? Right, that's a, that's a great question. Um, can I say both? Uh, I think it's both. Um, there are some crypto platforms that um, we've had discussions with that have absolutely no interest in regulation. Still, even today, um, which, you know, surprises us. But they have their model, they have their beliefs, and you know they've got successful business models working. Um, we we do the the large infrastructure players, the exchanges will be moving into this space. So the question is, there won't be just one player, there won't be one um, successful entity. So there, are, <clears throat> so the exchanges are moving into this area. The large infrastructure players are moving into this area because they are concerned that their business models will be obsolete in five to 10 years, yeah. unless they do move. Now, the crypto, um, the crypto uh, companies, the platforms, et cetera, there are a significant number uh, that we're speaking with and we understand are speaking to others as well. Uh, and they're exploring this. Um, and I think, you know, uh, frankly, my, from my perspective, unless you embrace regulation, you're going to have issues in the next several years. Mm. Do you, and do you think, back, like talking about, I'm going to go back a few years now in in the 2017, you know, days of the ICO and new sort of concepts of uh, tokenizing all sorts of forms of facilities and access points and assets and everything else. Um, that was a bit of a boom. Um, and then at the same time, I remember 2018 or whatever it was, everyone started talking about digital securities as being like the next day. This is where it's going to happen. To an extent, I, I definitely understand that. But to an extent, do you think that has happened or why has it not happened faster? Because they're, they're not giant global liquid platforms, you know, operating yet in mm -hmm. that space. So what, what have the blockers been? Why, why yeah. Yeah, it, um, yeah, it's very interesting. Now, re recall that that's the time I didn't believe in crypto. 
you know, and okay. I was doing the exploration to 17, 18. And, uh, and then I was convinced in, in terms of the blockchain and crypto and, and the uh, asset diversification opportunities and the strength of the platforms, the blockchain platforms. <clears throat> but what occurred is the ICOs occurred with no regulation and, um, and oversight. And now, you know, there's retributions of that. And, uh, you know, the regulators are slow in, in following up, you know, doing their investigations. And yes, in 18, there were, um, there were, everyone saw this as the next level, but there's this crypto bias there. A lot of these companies, as I just mentioned earlier, there are some very well-known crypto players that we've spoken with who really have no desire to go down the regulatory path. <clears throat> and that was the case three, four years ago as well. And I think that's one of the reasons um, they, you know, they believe that, you know, the, this, uh, this revolution, I, I used evolution, but this revolution was going to change that entire environment and that the regulators wouldn't have an opportunity to um, step in. Well, I think that's incorrect now uh, with all that's happened. And, um, mm. and uh, you know, just going forward, we, we were late. Oasis Pro, in regards to this entire market, we were one of the last players to come in. We got our license in December 2020. Uh, we really built our exchange evergreen. It took about a year and a half or, or thereabouts. Our ATS, not exchange, but our ATS. <clears throat> and having all the uh, rails in place and the, and the uh, compliance. And um, we, I, I think where we are right now with and the discussions with the large banks being more interested. And you're hearing news almost on a weekly basis of a bond issuance by a major bank like HSBC and others. It's, it's a trickle or a ripple right now. Mm. Eventually, it's going to be a tidal wave. And do you think, because like, we've talked a little bit about regulation and the Oasis platform, et cetera, and FTX. So do you think um, that countries emerging markets, local markets, et cetera, to, to build out virtual asset regulation? Or will it go down the route of everything is a security? It's a fantastic question. It's um, a, lot of, um, a lot of our colleagues that we're familiar with fall on both sides mm -hmm. of, of that, of that uh, question. I think it, um, you know, I have a regulatory bias. I'm an investment banker for years, so I, I, you know, I cut my teeth in a regulatory environment. I'm comfortable in it, uh, but I, you know, I do, I don't see emerging markets and other players uh, jumping on this. Um, most likely, it's the major markets in the world taking the lead, you know, and then um, the oversight, the uh, fraud oversight groups like FinCEN and others. Um, uh, taking the lead and coordinating amongst the major um, the major uh, money centers in, in order to um, to limit fraud and to grow this market. I see that as a necessary next step, and then it'll it'll um, um, certainly um, um, trickle down to the emerging markets. But we haven't really talked about emerging markets in any detail. The exciting thing about emerging markets, and frankly, one of the reasons I got involved in this was the opportunity for democratization and fractionalization. Mm. And in regards to allowing, and that's the blockchain, that's crypto. You know, you can buy an, you know, 1 16th of a Bitcoin. You can trade it. And uh, uh, you really can't do that with digital securities. Will that happen? Yes, eventually it'll happen. It, um, you know, but right now you have to understand who the players are. <clears throat> institutions really drive the market rather than individuals. So with, it, uh, with the proper regulatory oversight and the institutions yeah, demanding more access to digital securities, which in turn will have these large infrastructure players entering the market, then, you know, once that basis of, um, of assets is in place, you know, some, some tipping point, then it'll move into fractionalization, democratization. And there are major issuers that we're talking to. One of our, one of our investors is Redwood Trust, which in the US is a large um, uh, RMBS, residential mortgage-backed security um, uh, investor. Mm -hmm. 
I believe they have 60 billion outstanding currently uh, in regards to our RMBS issuances. <clears throat> their eventual goal and one of their interests in, in working with us and also investing with us was eventually getting to fractionalization and democratization because most of their issuances are 144. 144A, which is large institutions. And they would like to expand their investor base to retail as well. And and obviously the blockchain allows for that. Yeah, that's that's gonna be super fascinating. Yep. But but uh, and I've I've heard you talk before about you know NASDAQ, trade talks and Bloomberg and all of these things. Where when you talk about a digital security and you know in the context of maybe not everyone fully understands why so if I trade um, securities now on any application or any web-based sort of system, it's all digital anyway. What, what's, what's the difference? What, what, what's the key difference between that security being in that blockchain-based format and settlement system sure. for people who don't fully understand? Yeah, um, so, so today it's electronic. And <clears throat> with uh, the digital blockchain and tokens, it's on the, it's on the blockchain. So your wallet is on the blockchain. Anybody can, can um, determine your holdings. <clears throat> you know, you may not be interested in that, but that's a transparency piece of the blockchain. With digital, with, with our system, we um, can transact digital cash, like um, stable coins for digital securities. And that allows for what's called an atomic swap. So it's a simultaneous swap, which means zero counterparty risk. So if you go and you uh, buy a security today, uh, let's say it's an equity security in the US, it's uh, settlement time is two days. So it goes through this whole process with what uh, a central clearinghouse called DTCC and others with settlement and clearing. And it takes time to go through that process. With the blockchain, it's instantaneous or almost instantaneous. So it, you, you have access to your capital faster you, again, if you and I are transacting, I could take counterparty risk with you with a T plus, uh, trade settlement plus two days if you don't have the securities or you don't have the funds. Whereas with blockchain, it's, it's all verified and instantaneous. So, um, hmm. and, and frankly, the costs are less because you're removing certain middlemen from the whole process. So the key to getting um, digital securities and we're working on this. The key to getting digital securities to become ubiquitous is to make the UI experience, the user interface experience, uh, identical to what you experience today. For an individual- You don't know what the underlying technology exactly. is. Exactly, yeah. I mean, most people don't know what the underlying technology yeah. is today, it just happens. Yeah, and what about, what about um, I've heard before, so if I send a unit of, uh, of ETH or BTC around the world, you know, whoever I send that to, you know, owns and controls that asset. Can I do that with a security? Does it suddenly convert all securities into, you know, bearer bonds or bearer instruments? Or how, how can you control that? Uh, no, it doesn't. That's the issue with regulation. So KYC AML, AML anti-money laundering, KYC know your customer, or KYB know your business. Um, that's a requirement. So the bearer, the bearer issue, the um, being uh, anonymous, with crypto goes away with digital securities. And, and, and again, that's why it should be so um, comforting or exciting for regulators from our perspective and others in the industry, because we do the KYC AML checks. We have a record of who owns a particular digital wallet. We check the AML against um, uh, bad wallets, you know, in terms of, um, <clears throat> or OFAC, uh, which is a listing of, uh, uh, fraud players or bad actors. We check all that. And the regulators ha have access to all that information. So that's the downside, right? Which, you know, again, if you understand Wall Street, been on Wall Street, uh, understand uh, securities is, um, you know, is not why most of the um, maximalists who got involved in Bitcoin, <laughs> ETH, et cetera, got involved because it, uh, being anonymous was was the key issue, being away from the central banks. Um, but as I've shared with others, 
you know, Wall Street always finds a way to get involved and um, yeah. good or bad. But the KYC AML is going to be a critical component. Now, also, uh, the U.S. just announced the uh, Federal Reserve in New York, they're doing a 12-week trial for CBDCs, that's central bank digital currencies. Mm -hmm. That as well will be uh, KYC. So in order for any central bank digital currencies, which were digital dollars in the U.S. or um, digital pounds in the U.K., uh, they will know who holds. So that's big brother. Now, a lot of people may not be comfortable with that, but that's a direction every... Uh, and and tell, tell me, Pat, because you just mentioned the CBD, you, you also had a role, or you've advised the MakerDAO guys. Mm -hmm. So you have stable coin related, what are the algorithm, algorithmic based uh, stabilization techniques. I mean, MakerDAO is obviously over collateralized, et cetera, much more secure than the issues that we've seen with other algorithmic based stabilization mechanisms. Um, and then CBDCs developing again. Is that a kind of race to the top or will one eat the other? Or what, what, what do you think is going to happen there? Mm. Yeah, well, I think CBDCs are coming. You know, China is, is you know, definitely coming out with, uh, with um, their own CBDC shortly. I'm surprised it hasn't already been out. They've done betas for the last four to six years in major cities uh, in China. And this action by the U.S. government or the Fed is very exciting as well. But in regards to this, I think there's a place for both. Um, stable coins like MakerDAO is a lending protocol. So it's, it's very different from what the purpose of a CBDC. Yeah. There's also USDC, yeah. um, which um, is, um, you know, from my perspective, um, also most likely going to be a winner. Um, they're completely backed dollar for dollar in regards to uh, um, USDC's outstanding. But at least in the U.S., the view is that banks will be able to, because they have deposits, that are verifiable will be able to issue their own stable coins. So I see an opportunity for that as well. In a way, JP Morgan has already done that with JP Morgan yeah. coin. So I, I see that as the model, but I do see uh, an opportunity for uh, the major stable coins out there right now uh, to continue to exist. Is the market for them gonna be as large as, as I and others thought a couple of years ago? No. Um, but in my opinion, there'll be room for all of them. Now, unless the regulators decide that an algorithmic stable coin is illegal and uh, uh, USDC now and Circle are moving to become a bank. So in a, in a sense, they, they see some of the writing on the wall and will um, we'll go down the process of becoming a bank if they're successful and having their own stable coin. It's a super interesting time, isn't it? Because you have all these different races to the top. You have the CBDC stablecoin discussion, you have the crypto exchange and the regulated ATS exchange race to the top, legacy frameworks, new frameworks. Um, on, on, on that side of things, on the exchange side of things, I know Oasis also joined the this market integrity mm -hmm. uh, coalition, et cetera. Is that like a key differentiator between a properly fully regulated market and a less regulated VASP crypto market is the principle of market integrity, you think, something that doesn't quite yet exist properly in the virtual asset space? I and mean, you joined that coalition. I'd be interested to hear about that as well, if you can. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, in regards to your question. I Again, there is still, I would say, 75% of the uh, crypto companies out there are still of that mindset, you know, that's the reason they got involved into the blockchain space was uh, anonymity, the opportunity to circumvent the governments. I still think that's the majority by a wide margin of the um, of the focus. So market integrity is an issue there. Um, we we joined this coalition. Uh, Solidus Labs really put it together and, and brought in a group um, to to abide by certain principles, and. Um, um, you know, and, and that's very important for us uh, in regards to our approach. Um, we've been very regulatory and compliance forward. And, um, you know, by joining this, um, by joining this coalition, having uh, working groups, having the opportunity to, um, to focus on best practices, much of which come from the TradFi world, but incorporating blockchain is very important to us. Mm. And do you think, do you think it is, again, I, we talked a bit about regulation, that, I mean, tiny bit about market integrity. Um, and 
again, these large legacy platforms, trading platforms, you've talked about some of the efficiencies that exist. So why, 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 why are all massive exchanges not built on blockchain? If the pricing is there, if the efficiency is there, if the technology is there, if the operating models like uh, Oasis are there, what, what's, what's the blocker? What's the so, you know, slowing it down? Well, um, so, so we're getting very technical here. So, so I mentioned that tech is an evolution, but it is a, a wholesale change. So much of the uh, exchanges uh, globally um, really go back 40, 50 years. And um, the, one of the primary languages is Cobalt. Um, there's an issue with Cobalt right now because many of the developers of Cobalt are retiring and they're not being replaced. So, you know, most of the engineers are moving into blockchain and other areas. So, you know, those systems have been uh, built legacy systems upon legacy systems with, um, with old technology. And then integrating that now with blockchain is very expensive. So that's the primary reason. Now, APIs, which is a interconnectivity, which is how what we're based on, is a solution. Um, we are both Web3 and legacy in terms of API integration. We, we've developed both. So we can work with the large infrastructure players. But again, it, it goes back to um, you, you own a market today. Uh, granted, you have legacy systems. How quickly will you move the tech and potentially jeopardize your market, you know, in terms of the tech not working correctly, because that that happens. Um, and um, so so that's the hindrance right now. But we'll, we will eventually get there. There are, um, but but that's the, that's the um, you know, that's the main blocker right now is the systems don't integrate. And, and by the way, everyone recognizes that. Everyone recognizes these legacy systems, which has have what I call band-aids upon band-aids upon band-aids, um, will eventually need to be replaced. And, uh, and then it's a question of, are you willing, Joey, if you were running an exchange, to take the chance on the blockchain tech and, and walk away from this legacy? And that's the major questions and discussions going on. But is that, does that make it a more obvious thing for smaller markets or developing markets to focus on? It's surely easier to get a, a developing platform to adopt new technology than it is for a gigantic infrastructure-based mm -hmm. system. Is, is that an opportunity? Do you Huge think? opportunity. Huge opportunity. But, but again, as you, you know, in, in terms of emerging markets, for those who, who would like to take the lead on that, you have to get the regulatory environment in place as well. Yeah. Uh, in regards to what's occurred with FTX, we've talked about it a bit. Bahamian regulatory um, oversight right now is in question. Mm. And, um, <clears throat> and they were benefiting from FTX moving there and uh, an entire ecosystem developing around them. So that's a risk. Getting that, getting that regulatory oversight in place first and then allowing the building of the blockchain tech, which is available. I mean, our, our tech could work with any emerging market. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we've, we've touched on a couple of times. Where do you think the recent FTX related stuff, not to go into any specifics, and I'm not asking for you know advice or anything, but the trajectory of the ecosystem today, has this all been you know a two year setback or is it a blocker or is it a you know termination event you know what what how what what, what do you see as a trajectory of, of the whole ecosystem at the moment yeah it's um well it's evolving the um i i would say at least one issuer that we're working with uh has uh, has uh, said that they'd like to take a, a breath before they move into the digital security space um and, and, and it's, uh, and I understand their hesitation, they just don't know. But I do think it's probably a 24 month setback, uh, maybe longer. I think that um, you know, the good thing is, I think regulation will start moving quicker, mm. uh, especially in the US, but in all, also yeah. in other markets. So to me, this is a, um, there's gonna be consolidation. There's also a crypto winner going on. I've called it a crypto ice age, which is a lot of companies can't raise capital. 
And uh, it started in June, July of this year. I mean, you hear about successful capital raises, but there are a whole host of companies that approach us to invest in them. And uh, their valuations are down 30 to 50 to 70% from their last rounds. So it's going to be a difficult time for crypto, but it reminds me of the internet. So the internet was going, you know, was very interesting when it started. And uh, in the 90s, uh, the internet for me was email and everything on the web was shopping mm. or news. Now, utilizing the internet, I couldn't have imagined that we would walk around with these phones that basically are mm. supercomputers and we can do almost anything with. Hail a, a car, uh, order yeah. food, do all that. That wasn't even contemplated. And then the internet in the 2001, 2002 timeframe completely collapsed, right? It, there were high valuations, et cetera. And then a consolidation period occurred for several years. I equate to what crypto and the blockchain will be going through, is going through to that. And I'm, you know, I'm, again, my heart goes out to everyone impacted by FTX and Terra Luna prior, and there's going to be a lot of fallout from, with other um, companies. Um, um, mm. BlockFi uh, today may be filing for bankruptcy and it, it, this contagion is going to continue. Um, but I think the industry, both you know, blockchain, crypto, will be stronger in 24 to 36 months. And this will be, you know, basically with any market growth, it's a necessary evil to go through, through these types of uh, pullbacks. Do, do you think, Pat, that... Uh do you think that there's a natural move away from this wider array of virtual assets to the simple units of account like BTC? That, that's my first question. Or, or, and or, do you think that there's going to be a move away from regulation? So um, some people say you just, I mean, FTX was a regulated platform. You just can't tr trust a centralized exchange. Let's move out of that. I don't have any trust in the middleman. I want to have trust in the middleware. I want to move into decentralized networks and the DeFi universe and the unhosted related universe. Is that is that a direction of travel? Where do you see BTC in that context and regulation, no regulation in the other context? So I, I think BTC is here to stay. Uh, I'm a I'm a um whenever I give advice and this is just my opinion, I view BTC and ETH as the opportunity for diversification over the long term. Um, could be a decade, right? Um, but if the one wants to invest in this space, that to me um, makes sense. And I, I do think BTC is a commodity and not necessarily cash. And uh, I view ETH as the app store, you know, with all these protocols built on it. And as those protocols are successful, ETH will be successful. And they just went through this uh, proof of stake process, which was supposed to take a year, it took over five, um, and uh, it's working, which is really exciting to see, right, in, in terms of the blockchain. I do, I do think, you know, earlier I said about 75% of, um, you know, the crypto companies I'm familiar with, and, you know, through my MakerDAO relationships, I, you know, I, I have spoken and am familiar with a lot of DeFi uh, protocols out there. I do think a large majority of them will never move over to the regulatory side. And so I think there will be a bit of both. Um, they, they take a risk. And, and um, many groups don't even want to be in the U.S. because of the regulatory environment. What I don't think they comprehend, at least from my perspective, and I may be wrong about this, is that staying out of the U.S. doesn't protect you because the U.K., the EU, uh, the uh, Singapore and, uh, um, you know, other major money centers will all typically fall in line and they're always speaking to each other. So unless you go to, you know, a, um, you know, a, um, a new, new market, new emerging market, um, I don't want to mention any names, but, a, you know, a market that's not as sophisticated, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, these large money center uh, regulatory groups will will come after you. But but I think there will be a, a bit of both. And, you know, I mentioned the Internet earlier. Right. And and what I used it for initially and, and basically most of the market and where it's evolved to what's the most exciting aspect for me of DeFi and blockchain is 
next year, we'll be talking about a, a platform that I, we're not even contemplating mm. now. And in five years, it'll be even more so. I mean, that's what's happened with the internet. And to me, the blockchain is even more exciting in terms of the tech and DeFi and all these ideas and very creative approaches um, will be really exciting going forward. Now, there's going to be an overlay of KYC AML, granted. Um, but again, you know, at the end of the day, you know, is that so bad? Mm. Do you think, do you, let me ask you one, I'm going to ask you one last question. So what, what the opportunities are obvious and massive, um, the application of new technology and efficiencies to all sorts of things. I mean, it's pretty obvious. Um, but what, what are the biggest, what are the biggest risks? Do you think that, what are the biggest blockers to this? Do you think that now, given what's happened in the world and the FTX is, is the most obvious example, do you think we'll enter a stage of over-regulation where there's a, almost like panic stations to close things down and restrict access to, you know, retail users and mm -hmm. try to professionalize everything. Is that one risk or what are the other potential? What, what do you think the biggest risks are for the industry as, as it moves forward? Well, I, I think it's um, just a step back over the next couple of years, there's going to be extra caution. Um, you know, prior to this FTX announcement and, and frankly, Terra Luna, um, things were progressing really quickly in the public markets. Again, we're, our discussions with infrastructure players are really picking up steam, which is exciting. Um, so that hasn't slowed down. Um, but but I think that market acceptance of crypto um, in retail individuals is beginning to, well, not beginning, but there's a lot of questions. You know, crypto is a fad. Etc. You're seeing this right now. Um, I certainly don't believe it because, again, the underlying technology is so strong. I don't believe that overregulation will occur because, in in order for regulation, there's a there's a time period. There's there's a process. There's typically comment periods. Um, you know, uh, the SEC, for instance, can't just make an order for an entire industry and have it implemented. First of all, they don't have the staff for it. So, um, and then, you know, legislation takes forever, especially in, in the U.S., a divided Congress. But it's the same in all these other countries as well, right? All these other uh, major uh, financial um, centers. So um, I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not fearful of overregulation. Frankly, I'm, I'm fearful that there'll be another FTX and it'll set the industry back again, maybe in six months, maybe a year, uh, or in two years as, you know, the industry, uh, that's what I'm most fearful of. Mm. Do you think, uh, just one uh, one thing to add on, I think, um, a lot of people come up to me and they say, oh, FTX has happened, so I told you, you know, crypto is valueless and it's all, there's a bit of a, there's a bit of a loss of understanding between you know, what an asset is and what the, the platform that you're trading on is. I mean, if FTX explodes, it doesn't necessarily mean that the assets that are traded on that platform have changed. Mm -hmm. It's just a question of the infrastructure that allows you access to that network or protocol is being run in the wrong way. Right. Is that, do you agree with that? Or has this affected the underlying, or should it affect the underlying value of the whole theory of, uh, of, of a virtual asset. I, I completely agree with you. And I think that misunderstanding is pervasive. Um, the, the, the issue of FTT token is, is an issue and, and actually valuing your balance sheet based on illiquid tokens, altcoins. I think that's a mate that needs to be looked at hard by, and I know the accounting firms have been trying to come out with guidance in, in that in that way. Um, but yeah, I completely agree with, uh, you know, as you as you laid it out. And, and, you know, we're in, we're in the weeds of the crypto world in the blockchain world. So we understand what what has occurred at FTX. Um, but the casual uh, retail or frankly, institution, you know, there are uh, a whole host of portfolio managers who in their personal accounts, have been buying crypto for the last several years. But there's a, um, a cover yourself issue at the, at the CEO level or the C-suite level in regards to they don't want to invest in these altcoins. Um, I think Bitcoin and ETH has gone beyond that, um, but in regards to all these other tokens. And um, 
it, it, again, it goes back to like the technology. Who wants to take the risk? And that's part of what this FTX debacle uh, is is going to bring about. It, you know, it's a credibility issue. Yeah, 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 yeah. I agree. But look, I think it's been super, super interesting. I mean, I think that you you've talked about it before. The front end of of, of development regulation is a key point. I mean, I put Oasis definitely in that category, particularly on this digital securities world that, that's developing. It needs people to take the front line. And that's definitely why I put you in that Mavericks category as well. So it's been super pleasure having you today and a great conversation. So good stuff and you've got to keep going. I, we will. And thank you very much. I've really enjoyed it. Good stuff. Thanks, Joey. Thanks for watching Mavericks brought to you by Zappo Bank. Please like and subscribe for more episodes.